I'm hey, the everyone. wise one. <laughs> hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. So my grandfather always used to say to me that you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. But if I could have picked my family, this is who I would have picked as my two brothers. If you don't know them, they are Dr. Doug Lyle, Dr. Ellen Goldhammer. They are the co-author of The Pleasure Trap. You can see how well I have read this. And we're here today to get to know them a little bit better, not so much as doctors, but of friends of over 50 years. Please welcome Dr. Ellen Goldhammer and Dr. Doug Lyle. So great to see you guys on the day before my birthday. Oh, cool, AJ. Thanks for having us. Yeah, well, happy birthday. It. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've got to, I want to ask you guys some questions about your, your youth, because I found somebody that actually knew Dr. Goldhammer since kindergarten. God, and that's I was just... poor soul. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was all favorable. And I thought maybe you could talk about some of these things, uh, how you became the, the men you are today, and maybe if, if these are actually accurate, and if you know them to be true, please say so. So the first thing I found out is that Dr. Goldhammer, when he was young, used to put chairs in his backyard and do magic shows for the neighborhood and charge the neighborhood children. Is that true? That is true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so what kind of magic did you do, Dr. Goldhammer? Do you still have any tricks? Actually, what was, uh, what was actually more lucrative was, was carnivals. Oh, yeah. You remember the carnivals that we hand out little flyers and get them to show up and then put them through the paces. That was good. Oh my God, that's right. Yeah, all good. So I guess you were an entrepreneur from a young age. Oh you yeah. I, I learned that. Early, though, you need to hire security. <laughs> How much, what were these magic shows in carnivals? Say, say what, AJ? How much did you charge for the magic shows in the carnivals? Oh, it was, you know, of course it was back then. I don't remember exactly. Just as much as they had was the, was the goal. <laughs> <laughs> Yet the rates at True North are so reasonable. Well, the True North rates, though, are, are not set as market rates. They're, they're set uh, in order to encourage patients to stay long enough and return frequently enough that they can get good long-term results so they can prove that we're right and everybody else is wrong. Yeah. Nice. That's so, wonderful. you know, there are people that are known as outdoorsmen. But Dr. Lyle, your mother actually coined a term outdoor boy yes. for Dr. Goldhammer. So what is an outdoor boy? Outdoor boy is someone, when they come over to your house, they talk really loud. <laughs> and there's just a lot of noise. And then finally, my mom says, okay, time to go outside. So that's, that was, that was, Alan was the original outdoor boy in our house. That is fantastic. Okay. So you guys, I believe, met at a playground. So how did the friendship start? Were you guys just hanging out, playing basketball? or? Actually, I remember uh, we, it, this was a, a summer school uh, program before school had started. We had gotten, uh, we were both in this program where they brought kids to uh, a specific uh, uh, elementary school. But I remember, um, looking around and seeing that uh, Doug was a lot smarter than the other kids. And actually it was a lot smarter than the teachers too. So I figured he would be very valuable. And so I made a, a concerted effort to uh, establish a friendship with him. And I, I remember it very specifically thinking, boy, this one's a lot smarter than the other ones. Strange. I didn't feel that way. And I'm sure it wasn't true. He probably realized this one can be, this one, this one will probably pass me the ball. That's probably. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had identified you though, even before we got into basketball. Once we started playing basketball, it was really obvious because Doug was a better basketball player than the other kids, but that wasn't what the original uh, interest was. It was, I could really, it was very apparent even at that age that there was a significant difference in, uh, in aptitude. Actually. Now, now we're going to tell the truth. Okay, so here's actually how it worked out. Uh, uh, I was a nice kid and popular. Yes. <laughs> Alan was an odd kid and nobody knew what to think of him. So we had a scheme in the little government class 
about, about an economy. So there was like money that was printed up and I was sort of in charge uh, of running this economy and so forth. And so Alan, everybody had their little scheme. So we had a friend of ours named Mike Samuel, who he, he wanted to run a restaurant. So he would like bring little bits of food to sell and other kids, every kid thought about some idea to have an economy. Well, Alan thought, uh, Alan dreamed up this concept of a real estate scheme. And so he showed me these really cool maps of this peninsula with, I think they had water views. And then he, he had, uh, to, to show this is just absolutely hilarious to think that this is in the mind of a third grade kid. So he's got this big map of the peninsula and he's got these little tiny lots that he's showing all these view lots. And then, then uh, he, he tells me that I can have this parcel for like, I don't know, $1,000, whatever it was. And then, of course, I see, I notice, and then I can subdivide it and sell off these other little parcels. So I can sell off like 10 parcels. But then we realize Alan owns the whole island. <laughs> And so it turns out I'm a good shill because I'm a nice guy and people believe me. So I'm like, yeah. So I'm like selling this thing and Alan's just watching me sell this stuff. So Alan like made all of the money in the economy selling these lots that weren't there. This is very similar to water fasting. Like what do you sell? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's how this really uh, mushroomed in our real estate scheme. Yeah, I remember that. The yeah. development. Yeah, development. That was uh, that's where it started. So, what was your first impression of each other? Um, I I knew that this guy, this guy was uh, well, he's, he was very athletic and he was super, he was super stable. In other words, you uh, you couldn't shake him. So. He would be willing to ask questions of uh, the teacher, and if other kids had comments like the uh, or the teacher pushed back, Alan would persist, uh, and you you couldn't sort of knock him off his game. He wasn't going to uh, he wasn't going to go anywhere until he got satisfied, and so that was very interesting. And of course, that 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 foreshadowed essentially his sort of relentless curiosity and health. In other words, he, he wasn't gonna be deterred easily by something that didn't make sense to him. So that, that's what I noticed. And of course, under this now, 50 years later, I understand that this is a constellation of intelligence, disagreeable and emotionally stable is what this is. And so this is, uh, in other words, someone who who's like, no, I'm not buying that. No, what about this? What about that? What about this? With, with a high intelligence so that he can keep seeing the flaws of the other person's argument, but, yeah, but not, not ever be uh, intimidated. In other words, no, e even at eight years old, nobody was going to intimidate him. It, it reminds me of, uh, if anybody saw The Big Short, which is a fabulous movie, uh, the, the, one of the key characters uh, later in life is one of the guys that understands this uh, debacle that has taken place. And he's, he's uh, organized to try to not only profit for it, but he's also utterly disgusted. And we get a flashback to his childhood where, where the rabbi is, is telling his mother that my, my goodness, your son is so difficult. He's, he's seeing, he's looking for flaws in the word of God. And the mother says, well, did he find any? <laughs> that, that, that was absolutely beautiful. That, that sums up uh, my experience of watching Alan as a kid. That is so cool. So is it true, Dr. Goldhammer, that in high school there was a special chair somewhere for you? <laughs> well, yeah, it was actually, I don't think that was so much in high school. That was earlier on. The, uh, they did have a chair in the vice principal's office that was specifically reserved uh, for me when the teachers would send me into the, to the vice principal's office. By the time we got to high school, um, I really wasn't going to high school that much. I was working, so I didn't get into too much trouble then. But in, yeah, in elementary school, I would just kind of walk into the vice principal's office and sit in the chair. We didn't really have to talk about anything. It was just kind of the place that, we, that I went to. What were they disciplining you for? Oh, well, I remember one time one of the teachers, um, 
who was uh, particularly incompetent, uh, said, uh, you know, was upset with me because I was working on something else while she was talking. And so she sent me to the, um, so what I did was I started staring at her and wouldn't not, not stare at her. Wherever she went, I just kept staring really intently. And after a while she started to get upset and she said, you know, stop staring at me, but I wouldn't stop staring at her. So she sent me to the vice principal's office <laughs> And he said, well, what did you do? And I said, well, it's my fault. I was staring at the teacher. And he goes, oh, staring at the teacher? Yeah, I was kept staring at her because she was so boring. I didn't want to lose concentration. So I felt like if I just kept staring at her, maybe I could pay attention. <laughs> and he goes, is that really what you did? I said, yeah, I, 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 I admit it. I, I, and she called her up in the room. He, goes, he was staring at you? <laughs> and so it got her in trouble. It was great. And so then when I went back, I never looked at her. I would be very careful never to look at her uh, to the extreme. So she retired after that. That was her last year of teaching. Yeah. Oh, that is incredible. Well, like maybe that teacher didn't, didn't appreciate your brilliance. But what I heard from a mutual friend of yours in high school, and you can both clarify if this is true, that you both were so intelligent, more so than the teacher, that the teacher said to you, I will tell you when the test is, just go outside and play basketball, please don't come to class. Is that true? I, I don't recall anything like that. In, in, uh, as, a, as a senior, I actually didn't do any classes. I did all extra credit. And uh, so I, I actually didn't actually have to go to classes as a senior in, in high school. That, that was really my most productive year. So you, is that when you started your Sprout business? Um, yeah, I started working. Uh, at first was at, at Hyatt Hotels working there. And then, uh, then later uh, at the health food store and started growing Sprouts. Dr. Lyle, is this true about the book Ash, Atlas Shrugged that you actually told somebody you would give them $50 if they could stop reading it after chapter three because it was such a good book? I don't, I don't remember anything like that. That doesn't sound like me. Uh, uh, that, 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 uh, it, but it, when I was 19 or 20, uh, I was probably about 20 when I read that book. And uh, it's, it's possible I could have said such a thing, but, you know, maybe. You didn't ever tell me because I would have made 50 bucks. Uh, yeah, that would have been. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Well, okay. Well, uh, let's see what else. Uh, poker. Did, did you both play poker when you were younger? Or was it just Dr. Goldhammer? No, I played poker, but I'm, uh, at, we, we're going to have a recurrent theme that uh, I'm a nice guy. Okay. That's true. <laughs> so I play poker. It's with friends and it's all fun. When Alan plays poker, he plays to win. He played to beat you. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true that when people say, do you mind if I smoke, Dr. Goldhammer would say no, but then take out a personal fan and blow the smoke right back at them? That is true. <laughs> <laughs> he had this little fan. He could fold it up and put it in his pocket, and you just stick it right on the table and turn it, <laughs> point it right at the person. That is, that is a true story. <laughs> Is it true that the mutual friend said that at 16, you both knew exactly how your life was going to look? No, that, I mean, we might have said such a thing, but that, that I'm sure that wasn't true. We, no, nobody could have, uh, could have predicted, you know, their life at 16. The, um, <clears throat> I, I think we, we might have had a feeling that we would be, I think I had a feeling that we'd probably be connected uh, in, in some way. Uh, the, I, I couldn't imagine, uh, Alan was too interesting and <clears throat> I'm not too much into this idea that we're that smart. I think we're, I think we're intelligent people and there are many intelligent people. I think uh, where I sniffed that we were unusual, even as I said, uh, in the third grade, uh, I, I could pick up on this relentlessness and uh, this, this sort of, uh, now, now I would know it as, i.e. disagreeable, intelligent, and conscientious. So nothing, uh, the, the truth of the matter is people, people wouldn't appreciate this, but the same is true of Colin Campbell. 
So uh, people think Colin is a nice guy and he's an incredibly nice guy, but Colin has a, a similar stubbornness. Uh, in other words, uh, Colin is kind of, he, he's, he's something, um, it's, Colin is like that. In other words, he, he also isn't going to be pushed around by anybody. Now, Colin won't be so upfront about how he disagrees with you as Alan would be. Um, but, but Colin also w has that sort of stubbornness. And the, um, you know, John McDougall has a stubbornness too. John McDougall is much fierier uh, than, than any of us. He just has a more, his personality just has more, has more uh, fire. Alan, though, is relentless. He's like somebody that if he's going to dig a tunnel, he's going to take a sledgehammer and he's just going to keep hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting. And he, if it's giving, he's just going to keep doing it. And so I, I recognize that, that he had that same uh, nose for finding something that was effective and true and not being deterred no matter how odd it looked. Uh, and that would include growing sprouts and hanging out with people in yoga pants in, in 1975. It's like that was fringe weird. I mean, it's a little fringe weird, weird now and maybe it's cool, but if you go back to 1975, it was kind of way out there. And we were straight laced uh, kids. And yet Alan was gonna take a big detour and start talking about vegetarianism, which is, there wasn't the word vegan didn't exist. But it meant, uh, to, his, to his thinking, it meant no animal food. So we were there in high school. And, um, and, and it, uh, so I sniffed that this guy would absolutely follow his best judgment. And he was not going to be knocked off center. And that, that is an inherently valuable quality, really, if you take it anywhere. It's a little risky socially. So uh, that, you know, in, in the big short, now my favorite movie the last couple of years, I mean, that you, you actually, it takes that autistic character, uh, the Dr. Michael Burry character, to basically be completely undeterred, no matter what the whole world says, this guy's like absolutely certain that this is how the, the sky is falling and it's going to fall. And, and that, that uh, sense of certainty and intelligence and unshakability, that's what I sniffed in Alan. And so I, I felt like, you know, if, I think intuitively I knew it was going to be smart to get to stay near that. And that's what happened. You know, recently you, you gave me that test, that personality profile test, <laughs> which was to determine agreeableness and disagreeableness. Yeah. And I, I, at the first time he did it, uh, it was zero percentile. So. <laughs> right. And then I disagreed because I said, you know, I, I may be a little bit disagreeable. I'm not that disagreeable. So I took that other test. Yeah. And that, that came out the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, so that I, means that in 100 people, yeah. I would be miss, more disagreeable yeah. than, well, all of them. That's correct. Yeah. And that, See, you know, that's so weird because you've always been, I've always found you to be very pleasant, Dr. Goldhammer. Yeah, I find me to be very pleasant too, <laughs> but apparently that doesn't seem to be the case when we look at the objective testing. Well, yeah. Well, well, it, you, uh, yeah. When you talk about the personality test, it seems that other than the fact that Dr. Lyle is much more agreeable, you do have a similar personality. You're both very conscientious, very intelligent, not very open to experience, very emotionally stable. So would you say that except for the agreeability, you are kind of similar? Well, I, I think, yeah, we, we're similar in many ways, but we're also very di uns unsimilar in many ways. And I think that's been part of the thing that, that I recognized. He is much more socially appropriate. He can get along and go along. He's very sensitive to other people's um, thoughts and feelings. And so that's a very valuable skill to have if the goal is to interact with other human beings. So not having necessarily having those skills myself, it was obviously very useful to me to be associated with somebody that actually had those, those specific skills. I was like a consultant, AJ. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, you know, we got some important people coming. Maybe you could, you could, maybe we, yeah, you'd, you'd want to meet them. Like, like he's doing me a favor when really what, what I am is like, I'm like greased to the social interactions. <laughs> Which one of the two of you is more introverted? 
That's that's curious. Uh, I I think we're both pretty introverted. Uh, we're both we're both stable. In other words, we can get along with other people in a big group and stuff like that. That's not a problem. But in terms of our interest in actually seeking out groups of people and interacting with them, I, I, I would say, I mean, on the testing, we look, we look average, uh, strangely enough, both of us. But I actually don't think that's true. I think, uh, I think we're both in the bottom quartile uh, for that. Just when I look at our life experience, we, uh, the, tests, the tests are only... Uh, uh, I, I could talk for half an hour about psychological testing and why it's confusing to interpret and, and weaknesses in that. Um, and that would, be, that would be one of them. In other words, if you're asking, if you ask enough questions, then both of us are going to find out that, that we look average because we're not uncomfortable in uh, gr groups of people. We just don't want to be there. There's a difference. <laughs> and that distinction a lot of times isn't captured. Uh, in psychological testing. So I think we're both, you know, 20th, 25th percentile. That, that would be my guess. I'll tell you one, way, one place we're different, AJ, is Doug is significantly more competitive than I am. I mean, I remember situations where, you know, we're doing some playground basketball and, you know, somebody's a little bigger, a little stronger, a little meaner, and I'll basically just kind of stay out of the way. <laughs> you know, he'll go in and block their shot and steal the ball from them and just, you know... <laughs> take it real seriously and not uh, not be too worried about his own personal safety. <laughs> so, you know, I think he's significantly more competitive. Uh, yeah. I don't know where that fits under personality, but yeah, actually what you're seeing is um, that would, that would be true if I'm irritated. So the, and the truth of the matter is, is that what you're seeing is I'm less stable than Alan and he's found that curious. Now I'm actually quite stable. But Alan's super stable. So Alan emotionally, strangely enough. So th this is, this is uh, really unusual personalities, folks, um, are people that have multiple things that are very unusual. It's not just one thing. So uh, I suppose you could, be, you could be super disagreeable and everything else normal, and you'd just be known as an, as an ass. That's just, that's what you would be, okay? You could be super intelligent and nothing else unusual, and you'd just be, you know, some weird genius. That, uh, uh, but if you were super open and everything else was normal, you'd be known as this sort of wild, free spirit. The, uh, but when you start to get two things that are really unusual, now you start to get some very, very unusual co uh, combinations. So if you get, for example. Uh, very disagreeable and very low in conscientiousness. That's what we call a sociopath. Okay. In other words, there's, they, they think things aren't fair for them and they couldn't care less about the rules or other people's feelings. That's a very extremely dangerous combination. If you want to make it super dangerous, you add high intelligence and then you get a Kenneth Bianchi. Okay. So th that's what that is. That's what those combinations are. So now we're going to talk about Alan. <laughs> <laughs> so as you move these dials around it's like on a on your old kind of stereo where you'd move the treble up and the bass and left and right you know to the speakers so you can really you can really change the sound dependent upon the ingredients and so uh, uh, alan uh well like my, my favorite subject uh, of personality is steve jobs uh, because Steve Jobs was extremely intelligent. He was also extremely open. He was extremely conscientious. Uh, he was pretty outgoing. He was very disagreeable and he was very emotionally unstable. Steve Jobs was one of the more bizarre human beings that ever walked the earth to be so extreme on so many dimensions. Mm -hmm. And we see this life because of the extremely high intelligence, high openness, high conscientiousness, Steve Jobs was destined for greatness, okay? He, far more so than Bill Gates. Bill Gates is a, is a very bright, very conscientious guy. Uh, so he was, Bill Gates could have been your lawyer, okay? And in another life, he just would have been, you know, a really, really good litigator. And uh, he's not pretty quick, quick on the trigger uh, uh, verbally, 
but he would have been a really good corporate lawyer. That, that's what Bill Gates would have been. Steve Jobs was destined for something very unusual given his combination. And because he was so open, it was something new and different, okay? Uh, Alan has similarly a lot of very extreme characteristics. So uh, Alan's extreme stability and extreme, uh, very high, extremely high conscientiousness and strangely enough, high disagreeable, which you can't see. You can't see it because he's so stable and so conscientious and he's very smart. And as a result, he can see your point, even though he doesn't agree with it. <laughs> so he can see your point and he's, he's like, okay, I see how you're seeing it. So this is how we'll make our agreement. And it like, and you're thinking, okay, well, that's fine. He's a reasonable guy. And you don't realize that under those eyelids, his eyes are rolling. <laughs> and it's like, this is how we have to deal with these things called people, okay? And that's kind of where he's at, but uh, along the way, you don't even know. So I was very surprised at the disagreeable score. And I actually read him the test because uh, he's too lazy to actually read it himself. So I read him question by question uh, on the personality test, and he answered every single one of those exactly the way I thought he would answer them. So the, the just, I thought we were going to get, uh, I was actually feeling like that is really good. He was super honest about <clears throat> telling the story. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons he looked that disagreeable is because <clears throat> the test isn't so well constructed that it's willing to pick up somebody that's so conscientious and so stable that they would be willing to say, yeah, that's what I would do. <laughs> Most people would budge it a little bit, but Alan won't. He's going to be extra totally honest because of the conscientiousness. And he's not going to be intimidated by the fact that anybody might be upset about what he's going to say. And so that's the stability. So when you add that all together, you wind up with an extreme score that I believe is actually essentially mistaken. If you had a much more competent test, I think he'd wind up at the 80th, 90th percentile of disagreeable. The, uh, I, think, I, I think that's the truth. However, despite it all, <clears throat> the experience is an unusual one. And like I said, uh, you, you pick it up early. The other kids picked it up early. Even in, in, in the third grade, uh, Al, Alan was interesting. You know, there was other kids uh, that had talent. There were other kids that were, you know, bright kids. Yeah. There was kids that you, you, you picked up their personalities and they were really nice, interesting kids. We remember them, Marty Shulman. It was a great kid. Mike Samuels was a great kid. We, we Jim Souders was Jim. <laughs> the, uh, we, we had friends. They were, I, I don't know if they were friends of Alan's, but they were people that he put up with. <laughs> but Alan was definitely different. And he and I formed this, I, I was always put in a strange position because it was Alan over here, me next to him, and then all the other kids. And there's always this sort of dynamic tension that, you know, am I in the, I, am I, am I with the weird guy that's dangerous or am I with you then? <laughs> and I wound up with the weird guy that was dangerous. And the reason why was uh, I smelled this unusual personality that I'm sure some people felt that same way about Steve Jobs. Like, we don't know what this guy's going to turn into, but it's going to be interesting and fascinating and the same thing was clearly true i mean i think anybody that knew alan by high school recognized we don't know where this is going but our but our 10th grade basketball coach said we're all going to be working for gold hammer you know and i got into trouble on that i remember the day we we're in that classroom and barnett says you know someday we're all going to work for for gold hammer and i said no i'm only going to hire competent people <laughs> And he took offense. <laughs> yep, there you but go. But I remember thinking at the time, there's no way I'm hiring incompetent people. Yeah, there you go. Fair you enough. are so funny, Dr. Goldhammer. It seems like you really just say what you feel. He, he it gets you into trouble sometimes, though. People yeah. say they want honesty, but a lot of times they don't really want honesty. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting, Dr. Lyle, because 
I've often heard Dr. Goldhammer say, I assess a person's intelligence by how much they agree with me. And because I don't disagree with Dr. Goldhammer really on anything, I've always gotten along with him. I don't see that side of him. He's always been just so pleasant to me. <laughs> well, if you agree with him about AJ, if you got a couple of hyper-conscientious health nut whack jobs talking to each other, everything just seems completely reasonable. <laughs> You guys are amazing. So did you, uh, over 50 years of friendship, that's extraordinary in itself. People are saying they wish they had a friend like that. Were there ever any disagreements? Did you ever have periods of time where well, you're still I've mad at each other? I've learned experience that if I disagree, it's it, almost all the time it's because I'm, I'm wrong. And so I don't like being proven wrong. So usually when I find myself disagreeing, I go back and do some more homework and find out, you know, where it is that that disagreement comes from. One of the things that um, I always noticed in Doug is he thought of things that I didn't think of. He could do things that I couldn't do. And usually he's right, not always. And I take great delight in finding the occasional times when he's been mistaken or, or not fully informed. And, and I, I remember like each and every one of them and always bring them up if I ever get challenged. But you know, most of the time um, he's gonna be right because he's, he doesn't say things unless he's actually had a chance to think them through. He doesn't make a lot of impulsive, you know, comments. I, I'm always trying to commit him to something that I think might be off so that I can then go back and rub his face in it later. But he's really getting more and more difficult to do that as he's getting more and more cautious. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I always, there's the gold hammer trap. So we, this is, uh, this is uh, like if you study rhetoric at Berkeley, you know, for, for enough years to get your PhD in it, you'd eventually be able to spot this thing. So it's uh, suddenly you start with an argument and then pretty soon he's twisted it that he's in an, a position that's almost completely safe. Like there's almost no way for him to oh. lose the argument. So and then the dictionary comes out and we start defining the words and out of it. So yeah, we've, we've had uh, uh, arguments and we, we've had conflicts of interest over the years, these things happen. And that's going to be inevitable uh, when you have uh, two people that are, are inherently by nature pretty ambitious. In other words, uh, uh, ne neither one of us are couch potatoes that are just sort of uh, living the conventional life. We, we didn't do that. We, we, had, we, we had some adventurousness in us. And so there's going to be places where we, where, you know, where, where the adventure goes from here you know, there, there might be some conflict. And so that, that has happened. And, uh, and that's been, that's been, uh, I, I would say that's been, <clears throat> uh, those kinds of things are, I have been probably been a little, a little tougher on me at times, just because, you know, uh, Alan's kind of like, uh, Word is Alan's, oblivious. Kind of like, Alan's kind of like the earth and every, everybody else is like a, a moon, you know what I mean? There's like this big gravitational <laughs> force. And, uh, and so sometimes you, you, need to, you need to get a little further away, you know, to explore uh, kind of yourself and what you want to do. And so, uh, and, and so that, you know, that, that's going to happen over 50 years. And so that, that has been part of the journey. But when, when I when I look back at it, 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 it seems it seems strange because life seems you know very long. There's been so much that's happened, but at the same time, it seems incredibly short. Because I can, I, I don't so much think of us as uh, strangely enough. I don't think of us as kids, but I do think of us as teenagers. Like I I I think of us and who we were, kind of who we were then and who we are now is not that much different. You know, 17, 18, 19, 20, we were we were very similar. And so uh, I can, it's, it's a strange thing looking back and thinking about how unbelievably valuable uh, this friendship has been. It's, it's a strange uh, drawing of the straws. The, uh, the, the, you asked us about a title and the diabolical basketball thing. The, uh, the truth of the matter is Alan's relentlessness about health uh, starting at 16 has turned out to, of course, for me personally, to have been unbelievably valuable. I mean, forget professionally, you know, I, I would have done something and I would have been good at it and I would have made a decent living and everything would have been fine. Uh, but, the, uh, but, but what happened was 
that gravitational force of Alan like drew me closer to this entire uh, uh, field of knowledge, even though I wasn't inherently interested in it. And so, uh, and as a result, I became very knowledgeable in it and then I'm completely convinced. And the more I learn, the more, the more grateful I am that I not only found this information, but I found it early, okay? And I didn't find it, Alan found it. And so Alan was very convincing and relentless and had that same, had that same feeling when he's talking at 18, you feel like, yeah, I, I, I better listen to this guy despite every 50 year old saying he's crazy because they can't answer his questions and he's not backing off and I'm seeing his logic and I'm seeing them in trouble. And it's like, I, I'm seeing them walk into the gold hammer trap and get slaughtered. And you know, when, when you see that enough times and you've been seeing it for 10 years, you're like, you know what, this guy, is, this feels like this guy's right and he was. I mean, when you think about that, for somebody to be absolutely dead on right about health and all these consequences at 18 years old, phenomenal performance. And so, you know, yeah, whatever the vicissitudes have been, uh, it's been incredibly valuable. That is such a great testimonial to the friendship. So there was never any big blowouts like over a girl or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wouldn't say there was a blowout over a girl. There was some, there was some, uh, there was some tough days for me over that. <laughs> That's a different story. <laughs> you know, Doug used to be and is still a voracious reader, and it saved me. I don't know countless hundreds of hours because he would read like everything. And then instead of me having to read it, I just could hear him interpret it and, you know, kind of get the gist of it. But every once in a while, I would stumble across something that he hadn't bothered to read. And one of them was a book called uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic. And I happened to read that book and I thought, well, gee, you know, this sounds pretty good. I better run it by Doug and see, you know, if it's valid or not. And I remember when I first suggested, he kind of like, you know, poo-pooed it and whatever. But then he actually looked it up Maybe actually pulled the studies. <laughs> then he decided, no, no, this guy actually figured it out. You know, the, this whole drug business in psychiatry has a lot to be desired. It, it's not, it's not being done properly. And so, you know, that would be an example where I would remember that one instance. We won't talk about the three hundred and fifty other books. That, you know, that was a big one. Yeah, and I remember that. I remember. And it's particularly uh, sweet because it was in his own field. You know, that was yeah, the, that was the best that part. Was bad. <laughs> that never should have happened. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was a big one, folks. That's a perfect example of uh, of Alan's sort of relentlessness uh, in pushing me on on reading that book. And it was right after it came out too. So the um, and so uh, I and I remember reading. It's not a convincing book in the first five or six or 10 pages. So I was rolling my eyes, really irritated, pushing back against it. But uh, it was because Alan was, was basically forcing my nose in it. Uh, I, I got through, you know, to 15 or 20 pages where suddenly the argument was improving. And, um, and, and now then it got my curiosity. And then from then on, uh, it's a horror story. So... The yeah, anatomy of ep epidemic was, uh, I think, uh, I think maybe, I can't remember, but that that's certainly one of the big cornerstone changes. Uh, uh, what we would call a paradigm shift in thinking. Paradigm shift is what takes place when you find out that some massive assumptions that that uh, of which you formulated your your thinking around are wrong. Uh, that's what a paradigm shift is, and so. The, that, that was a, I was no big believer in psychiatric medication. I, I always considered psychiatry though, to be sort of my big brother sitting behind me while I played poker and they were staking me that uh, if, I, if I made a mistake and something went wrong, they were behind me with some fancy guns from people with fancier degrees than me that you know took super complicated chemistry and really understood this and that. And it turned out, oh no, it's all BS right down, down the line. And so therefore it was a, the paradigm shift for me was not only finding out that that's a very bad way to go, but also 
realizing, oh my gosh, as a psychologist, I'm on my own. It's a, it's, it's like, it's like when your parents die and there's no, it's like, it's you. It's like, there isn't anybody else to turn to. And that was, uh, you know, at, at midlife to, to suddenly find out that there was no parents in the world of psychotherapy and psychological help. Like, oh no, it's me. That was both, uh, I was ready for it, but it was also a surprise and it was a super important moment uh, for me career-wise. So once again, you know, Alan's relentlessness finds something for me that was super important. Wow, that's incredible. So you guys, um, I, to the audience I'm talking, a lot of questions were sent in, but please keep in mind, I always give preference to the ones that were sent in. So if you're not on my mailing list, get that. But a lot of these questions are really deeply personal medical questions. So just know that Dr. Goldhammer, if you are interested in going to the True North Health Center, he does do consultations for free to address these unique medical concerns. And Dr. Lyle also does consultations. So out of fairness, I'm only going to ask questions today that pertain to both of them. So we do have a few actually that came in for both of of you. And one is from Stephanie. And she says, your fabulous and important book, The Pleasure Trap, was written in 2006. And there have been advancements in science. And I'm sure you also have new revelations. Will you have a revised editions with new thoughts and science coming out any anytime soon? And I would add any chance for having another book in collaboration with you guys. Well, one thing that's really important to make is that there's been tremendous scientific development since The Pleasure Trap is written. And most of it has gone uh, and to prove that what we said in the pleasure trap is actually valid. The science is finally catching up with the, with the suggestions, the premises and the philosophy that we expressed in the pleasure trap. And although there are minor changes that may uh, need to be, uh, we may need to do an update version and include some things that, that Doug may not have integrated into the pleasure trap originally, uh, none of that's gonna happen until he completes the work of the book that he's working on right now. Uh, that is hopefully going to be due in the near future. Uh, and so no, there's not going to be any distractions for, for anything until he gets his current work done, which is going to be a very important uh, book. But I don't think that there's been any uh, changes that negate any of the basic premises that he wrote in The Pleasure Trap. I also want to be really clear, uh, AJ, this was an interesting collaborative work. And, you know, there's two parts to a book. There's the title of the book, the, and then there's the, you know, the writing and the actual uh, conceptual development. I did the title and, you know, in order to allow Doug to feel like he had a, a part in it, allowed him to do all the writing and the conceptual development. So it, it, it's a, it absolutely was a collaboration in that regard. And so anything that's really good, I'll take full credit for and participation. Anything that might be deficit, since Doug did all the conceptual and, and writing work, that's his responsibility. So he'll be responsible for updating it uh, in the future, but not until his current book is completed. So Dr. Goldhammer, it, I know that you came up with the title for The Pleasure Trap, which really is one of the most important things in a book. Absolutely. Did you ever, did you ever think of calling the book Why People Are Fat, Sick, and Miserable? <laughs> <laughs> you probably did. The, um, yeah, I, I would agree. I actually had an interesting process in the last five years thinking about The Pleasure Trap. Uh, seven or eight years ago, I, I actually was personally, I, I was looking at my life, uh, at midlife and thinking, okay, what's your biggest risk factor in life? And I really wanted to know. And I was very confident that cardiovascular disease was going to be exceedingly unlikely. And <clears throat> so what I did, uh, I thought, well, you know, the bullet that comes out of left field is cancer. So that, that's, that, you don't see that one coming. If, I mean, you could die of a heart attack, some freak aneurysm, but you're going to have high blood pressure. You're going to be, you're going to have chest pain. It's exceedingly unlikely that you're going to be quote, totally healthy and fine. And then wind up with a cardiovascular mortal incident. That's just, that would be way out there statistically. But cancer, that could just happen to you. And uh, at any time from any, uh, any, any direction. So that's what I was most worried about. So what I did was I, uh, I actually went into the national uh, statistics and I very carefully tabulated uh, across the years what looked like what people died from of various diseases. 
and I ran, uh, I did my own uh, calculations as to risk factors. And then I looked at the scientific literature about cancer and vegan diets and so on and so forth. And it was disturbing. And what was disturbing was people that are healthy oriented eaters, um, they have an advantage, but the advantage is not nearly as big as the way that Alan and I presented this in the pleasure trap. And the reason why we presented it in the pleasure trap as a bigger advantage was because of the work of Colin Campbell. And so we, we were obviously completely believing and completely trusting of Colin Campbell. And, uh, and so when we wrote it, I felt great about a chapter called Environmental Revolution, which really tells the story of uh, Colin Campbell. And, um, and so then 10 years later, as I'm looking at this evidence, I'm thinking, whoa, we overshot this evidence. And it, it feels, it felt, I felt a little bad about it. And so people have asked me, what would you change? That very question. And really the only thing substantive I've said, I've said, you know, I, I would have toned that down. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Colin's new book comes out, <laughs> okay? And I'm looking at that new book and I'm looking at that same evidence that I was looking at 15 years ago or 20 years ago, but it's updated. And I'm looking at it and it's like, son of a bitch. It's just like we said, <laughs> yes. okay? And, um, and I think that what we now understand is something I think, and it, I, I'm not sure we understand this, but this is what uh, we believe to be true. We've, uh, Alan's had a conversation with Colin about this. So I think we now know something that we didn't know, AJ, which is probably important, but we're speaking a little bit out of turn because I don't know that anybody knows, but this looks very suspicious. And that is that uh, Colin's evidence, which is so extraordinarily impressive, uh, begins, the bedrock begins on correlations around the world on evidence of, of uh, really the most important variable being animal protein as it correlates with cancer development and cancer mortality. And it's extremely low in areas where, where uh, the animal uh, protein consumption is low across a variety of cancers. And so, the, and it's like, why? You know, how come that isn't showing up in protecting vegans more than it protects them? Vegans get some protection in the U.S., but it's not nearly what you see in worldwide evidence. And then it occurred to us that the answer is probably because the people in those societies are essentially quasi-vegans from birth. Right. So, so in other words, if you become a vegan at 80, don't expect it to save your hide with respect to your prostate cancer it's probably already started and it gets diagnosed at 81. One year of the veganism isn't gonna reduce your risk by 90% the way it would have had you started at age one. And so it's kind of like cigarette smoking and pack years and that sort of thing. So, the, um, so I would probably, uh, in rewriting that chapter, I might make that point, but the extraordinary value of, of essentially having a, a very low animal food diet remains as resoundingly um, outstanding as it was in the way we wrote it. We just didn't understand that important detail. And in defense of the pleasure trap, we did reflect that in the pleasure trap quiz where we gave people a chance to reflect on their past history and tried to give a, a rough rating system, a point system. And that reflected the fact that the longer you had done things, the more impacting it has. But it was really Doug's insight into this idea that, oh, these guys have been vegan forever versus, oh, we've maybe not been vegan so long that that might explain a big part of the difference in, in our US data versus foreign data. I think that that's very, very likely to turn out to be true. Yeah, and that's, yeah, huge, again, that, that uh... So, so my love for Alan is up about 25% in the last couple of months because of the insight. <laughs> like, I saved me at 16. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what, what the heck? That, that's what I think we, uh, but I don't think there's anything else in that book that catches my attention uh, because we wrote that book carefully as a, as a conceptual work, you know, around the, uh, the, evolutionary psychology and the, and the problems 
of trying to do this right and uh, and how and how haywire the world is environmentally uh, around the food issues. And so we weren't writing a a specific technical detail. We weren't writing the starch solution. So uh, as a result, uh, I feel like we were very we were intentionally protected there because we we didn't want to have to go. We had to guess. Uh, where the scientific data would show and where we guessed, uh, where we had a little bit of data and we thought it was going, we were dead on right. So yep. 10, 10, 15 years later, they're writing things like sugar, fat, salt, and you know, Neil Barnard is writing, you know, breaking the food seduction. Right. We were ahead of the curve on that because we were, we were basing our inferences not only on Alan's clinical observation for 20 years, but also on evolutionary theory. So it turned out we were right on target. You know, it's interesting too now as that the pleasure trap, which has been out for a long time, is now actually starting to sell. So it's finding an audience because I think it really was ahead of the curve. And also now it's a little bit different. Now people read books on exposure uh, through things like podcasts and things that we're able to get access to. So we can talk to a broader audience than we were able to. Uh, 15 years ago, it was really difficult to get those major kind of audience uh, uh, to be exposed to it. So in, in some ways, it was, it was a disadvantage being ahead of the curve, but at least, you know, we more or less got it right. And we got somebody to do the audio version for us. Oh, and that's so great, because a lot of people don't like to read nowadays, but yeah. they will listen. And, yeah. and this woman did such a great job of doing, uh, it just really um, did justice to the book. Uh, that we got a person that could do such a fabulous job doing that audio version. Thank you so much for that, AJ. Oh my God, thank you so much for the, for the privilege. You know, I'm sure both of you have had patients that as difficult as it was escaped the pleasure trap. Do you find that they now have more pleasure than if they were still stuck in the trap? Say again? Well, you know, escaping the dietary pleasure trap or any pleasure trap is very difficult. Most yeah. people, like Dr. Lyle has said, don't have the chops and will never be able to do it. Right. But I'm sure after 40 years as doctors, you both have success stories of clients, right. patients that did escape the trap. Do you yeah. find that they now have more pleasure than when they were getting pleasure from these things? I don't know if they have more pleasure, but they certainly have a lot less pain. So, yeah. you know... Uh, being in a pleasure trap, part of the appeal is that it's very intense short-term pleasure. So, you know, you pay a price for that. And escaping the pleasure trap uh, of any kind is amongst the more difficult thing people are going to try to take on. And I would agree, not everybody will be successful um, at escaping the pleasure trap. But uh, the fact is that doesn't make it any less important uh, a, a task. You don't just say, well, this is difficult, so forget it. I'll just give up. Um, people have the right to understand if they're willing to pay the tremendous price and put in the tremendous effort, there is a potential reward. And many people do achieve that reward and they don't look back and think, oh, it wasn't worth the trouble or the effort. So the important thing is to quantify just how big the effort is so people know what they're getting into. And then they can decide for themselves once they're out of the pleasure trap, whether or not it was worth the trouble. Yeah, I, I like to, uh, that's such a, that's a, a sort of a strange question. And so let's, uh, one of the premises and a, the accuracies of the pleasure trap is to essentially explain that supernormal stimuli with respect to food is going to go through a drug-like process of, of where the, the person's nervous system is going to adapt to that and therefore not, uh, it's going to have a blunted effect. Uh, so so the, that question is, in principle, could be solved probably now or at some point in the future by using PET scans of the brain to look at the dopamine reactivity. And so undoubtedly, once again, writing way ahead of the evidence, I have no doubt, well, let's suppose that a maximum uh, a score from food, for example, would be 100 units on, uh, on a scale. And so let's suppose that uh, in terms of natural food, the person's highest uh, hit would be, say, a fruit salad of really good oranges, a really good banana, really good apples, and uh, really good peaches. So for, so for me, if you put those four things in a bowl, and they're all really ripe and excellent, quite frankly, that's about as good as it gets, okay? So if you were to do the PET scan of my brain at that point, for me, it would be hitting those 100 units. Now, 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to put me on peach ice cream for three months and chocolate ice cream. And now what's going to happen is the brain's going to neuro adapt. And now, now those things are going to hit hundred too. And now uh, for a while, and then what's going to happen is three months from now, we're going to go back to my bowl of healthy food. And now it's going to be at 60. Okay. So now it's at 60, but now the chocolate haagen is at hundred. So now we say, okay, uh, so now what? Well, the answer is now we're going to flip it around and we're going to get rid of the haagen and go back to the stuff. And now what's going to happen? The fruit bowl is going to go back to hundred after three months. Right. So now, now we can see that in fact, uh, if I'm out of the pleasure crap, I'm getting just as much pleasure as somebody that's eating the chocolate haagen because there, you wouldn't expect this system to be effectively, there would be a maximum amount of reactivity in the system that would happen. Uh, and all that happens with supernormal stimuli is, I mean, you could be getting, you can't really get past the optimum. And I, I don't think that the modern processed food gets past the optimum for what is actually possible for that brain in the same way that, for example, heroin or crack cocaine does. Okay, that, that, that does things that were never supposed to happen. But an extraordinarily positive pleasure response from your natural food when you're hungry and the food is outstanding, I think that I think that, that is a that that would be a hundred percent of that response. And I think that what happens is is the modern processed food gets there very easily. Yep. And so so then what happens consistently. is when you do that, then you habituate the brain and now the healthy food can't get there. And so that's, so I think the answer is, uh, yeah, I think that once you're out of the pleasure trap, you get just as much pleasure from your, from your food as anybody who's eating, you know, greasy pizza and chocolate uh, ice cream. I actually, I believe that that is true. We did a, a study at the True North Health Center, AJ, on taste adaptation, where we actually were able to detect minimum thresholds to sugar and uh, uh, salt, and also hedonic response to food. And what we were able to show very clearly was even moderate amounts of fasting changed the ability to perceive your tastes actually change and the response to food changes, the likingness of sugary and salty foods changes. So it happens quickly with fasting. It happens slowly with just healthy eating. We know from the literature, it can take around a month or so to neuroadapt to a lower salt intake and as much as three months to neuroadapt to a lower fat intake to where people feel satiated uh, on a lower fat diet. So there is a lag. That's one of the benefits of fasting is it might shorten that lag a bit, but it does happen over time. So you have to get people to persist in the healthier diet long enough to where they get to the point where, as Dr. Lau just described, you get to the point where you start to appreciate the simpler, milder food. It's very similar to music. If you're used to loud rock and roll music and then you listen to classical music, you may not get as much input at first, but if you keep listening to classical music, it's not like you're not gonna like music now because it's not loud and you know, be feeling it through the soles of your boots, but you, there is an adaptation that takes place. And are you gonna say that people that listen to classical music don't enjoy music as much as people that listen to loud rock and roll? And the people that listen to loud rock and roll may go deaf as a consequence of it. So it doesn't mean that either, either of them are inherently bad, but there's a price that's paid for that excess noise. And it doesn't mean that quiet, milder music can't be appreciated. That's, That's a really just, good analogy. Just so many people don't try because they think that they're not going to have any pleasure if they oh, give up. Sure. Nice. You're designed to seek pleasure, avoid pain, and begrudgingly, I have to admit, to conserve energy. You know, that, that motivational triad in the pleasure trap was an interesting thing. Doug obviously came up with it. And I argued vehemently against it because I just thought, oh, this energy conservation business you know, where did you make that up? And it turns out, of course, it's totally valid. It helps explain everything. But I will admit that my contribution was to absolutely solidify his conviction that, in fact, that was the motivational triad. <laughs> That's fantastic. So we call this broadcast Dr. Alan Goldhammer's Diabolical Health Basketball Strategy. I wonder if you can expound on that. And I'm wondering if this question fits in with that, which is yes. where do both of you sit on the continuum of abstinence compliance versus indulgence moderation? And how has that affected the way that you personally eat and counsel your patients 
and their ultimate success. So we've started in this experiment, you know, when I met Doug the first time it was fourth grade uh, and, you know, he was better than I was and it frustrated me because I felt like I should be able to compete. And I practiced and worked and hard and, and I really got involved in this hoping that maybe improving my health would give me an edge so I could actually beat him. It, of course, it's completely failed because he's adopted the same kind of health promoting habits and he still crushes me. Uh, our most recent episode here was just a week or two ago where after diligently working on uh, shooting drills because you know the gyms are closed uh, and as I say, besides the, all the death and the worst part of this pandemic is the closing of public gyms. But in any case, he's supposedly off diligently working on his book, shows up shooting better than ever, which tells me that he's been working a lot more on his shot than his book writing. But in any case, this whole thing for me was about trying to, to improve health as an edge on the competitiveness in basketball. But I have a theory that your diligence, if you're really super diligent with diet and lifestyle, you should age out as slow as possible. If you're a self-indulgent, you'll probably age out a little bit faster. And so I've been hoping that he was going to age out faster than I have. Unfortunately, to this date, 50 years or whatever it is, that's not happened yet. But we're still early in the course of things. And I'm hoping that his self-indulgent, that occasional piece of vegan carrot cake or whatever else he occasionally does, when I'm not around, will eventually cause him to age out slightly faster. And so hopefully by the time we hit the 80s, I will eventually be able to beat him. <laughs> that's a good story. The, uh, let's see, the, the rest of that question does have, is the more interesting part of it, which is that, um, that our, our different personalities and how we look at this uh, probably does impact how it is that we talk to people about, about their, uh, how, how to approach these goals. And so the uh, Alan is, uh, there always has to be, somebody has to like take the extreme position. You know I mean? There's, <laughs> this is well, this is well known in science that uh, great value is, is had by somebody that goes way out at the edge and essentially makes everybody else have to deal with the ultimate uh, consequences of, of a position. So this is super valuable in, in many, uh, many different um, uh, lines of investigation in, in the world. And, uh, and this is one of them. So one of them is, okay, uh, if this is having drug-like effects then how would we get out of a drug trap? Well, we don't get out halfway. Okay, so uh, Alan, so Alan's position is, hey, you just freaking just uh, white knuckle, go cold turkey, get super clean, and that gives yourself the very best chance. Uh, now, that, that's a very interesting uh, position, and I have met many people who have done that and will have reported to me that it is exactly as Alan says that, you know, after three or four months, they don't crave anything uh, that they wouldn't even dream of going back and that they are completely satisfied. Those individuals exist. And I have, I've run into those people uh, and they call me about other issues in their life because that's not one of the issues. So, uh, so thank goodness I have some other things to talk about. Oh, I have like, we have uh, Jan, Dr. Jan Hawk and I have a thing called the Living Wisdom Library on our website that we talk about other issues in life. And, uh, I, and I noticed that Alan is not a member of the Living Wisdom Library. No, he doesn't need any more information about anything. I go down and look at the names every, every month or so. No, no, Alan. <laughs> no, he doesn't need any more information. He's got it all straight, just the way. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, but that is that sort of extreme position. Um, there's a, a great deal of truth in it. Now, it turns out that from, from what it is that I've learned as a clinician, there's another very unfortunate uh, truth that also exists. And, and that is that, um, that if you set the bar too high for an individual, that if it's past what they think that they can do, then they will often quit putting energy into it. They'll quit. Uh, this is a, a thing that I call the ego trap. So the ego trap is, is if we're embarrassed 
over the fact that we cannot perform up to the level of expectation, then we will uh, walk away from the challenge and hide from it. And so the, uh, the ego trap is a natural problem. In other words, it's a, it's a natural human instinct that under those conditions, human beings will, will go away from the challenge. That, that's a, uh, it, it involves a sophisticated cost-benefit analysis about whether it's worth continuing to try or we should quit because it's too embarrassing because we're likely to fail. So um, that is a, is the pleasure trap, on the other hand, is an unnatural phenomenon. Pleasure trap does not exist in nature. So it turns out that these two problems have actually very different solutions to them and that those solutions are in contradiction. And that, that is a disturbing thing because an orderly mind says, how could the right thing have two very different answers? And the reason is, is because of the pleasure trap. The pleasure trap is an inherently unnatural, it's an artificial problem and therefore, it requires an artificial solution. And an artificial solution means going against instinct. So your, your instincts are telling you, um, if you are intimidated by something, that if it's too high, then back away from it. The pleasure trap is basically saying the best way out is to set the bar all the way up at the maximum uh, perfection because that's actually how we're going to break an addictive process. That, that challenge is an extraordinarily high bar. And as a result, uh, many people who will try uh, and believe that that's the only, the, the only way to get traction will wind up failing off and get intimidated and then ultimately quit. And so because I am sort of the catcher in the rye, in other words, I wind up with a lot of those people that what I try to do is I, 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 I can hear the pleasure trap. And so as a result, what I've done is I've said, listen, we have to set the bar lower. Now we're gonna pay a price for that because we're not going to get the anti-addictive detoxification of your taste preference mechanisms and all of your habits. That is the easiest, it's, it's taking off the Band-Aid slowly, okay? And so we all know it's a weird thing when we've done it both ways. It's like, which is the best way? And it's like, well, I'm not sure what the best way is. And the, um, so it's an, an inherently conflicted problem. And so I, I would say that uh, sometimes, occasionally, my attitude with people is you got to go all the way and put the love, you got to put the foot to the floor and you got to do it perfectly. Uh, your condition, your situation, what you're facing in life, that is the right solution. And you need to damn well do it, okay? There needs to be no excuses. On the other hand, that's not usually what I'm doing. Usually I'm dealing with somebody that is, is overwhelmed and embarrassed and, and can't manage to get any traction. And we need to start somewhere and we need some level of success to build on. So that's, that's uh, I think, where it is that, I think we both, Alan and I both see this dynamic. Right. And, uh, and I don't think that we really disagree. We just, we, we would probably disagree. Um, if you gave us a hundred patients, we would have some disagreements. Alan would be pushing them harder for perfection and I would be nicer. That's just cause I'm a nicer guy. Yes. I, I would that, agree with that, that, you know, I would try to push for perfection cause that's my own selfish interest, which is to get those good long-term clinical outcome data. But I would agree that that's gonna crush some people who are not ready to try to deal with that. And the right strategy is just what you're saying, help meet people where they're at and try to move them along. So eventually maybe they'll be ready to take on uh, the full scope of the pleasure trap. And so, you know, but it is, it's incredibly difficult. If pleasure trap and ego trap are both dynamic, the likelihood of success is less than if it's one or the other. It's interesting, we, when we wrote that book, you know, Alan had a huge amount of clinical experience by that time. He, had, he was 20 years in. And um, we actually wrote, the, the book was published in 2003, not 2006, by the way. The, um, and so we already knew this was really hard. And what we didn't, uh, in, the, in the 20 years since, we found out that it was even harder than we thought. Yeah. So... The, and it remains 
the most underestimated problem in health. Yes. It is not the problem that people are talking about. So most of the wise people in health are talking about how we need to get away from animal food and processed food. That's all fine and that's all true, but they are missing the big, they all believe that education and that, you know, if we tell the government to make the food period di different, it's going to make a big difference. It's not going to make any difference. Now, nobody's listening and could care less what any expert says, and they're not, mo sure, 2% of the population does. I've met some very diligent moms that are worried about their kids, and they're listening to all kinds of things. And if they got the right food pyramid instead of the wrong food pyramid, they'd probably do a pretty good job following it. But they're the outlying freaks. The truth is the average person couldn't care less and their life is being absolutely dominated and decimated by the pleasure trap. And the pleasure trap is the heart and soul of the problem we're facing. The problem is not education. The problem is the pleasure trap, which is even once you understand it, it is an unbelievably tricky, slippery, almost impossible problem to solve. So really, as Alan says, the only solution is come to true north. <laughs> And then the other problem, Doug, is they come to True North and do great, but then when they go home, sometimes they backslide. So my answer was no more going home. <laughs> and you were the one that pointed out that may not be practical. Yeah. Oh, oh well, that's not your problem. Well, no, I, I'm just looking for the answer to this problem. That's yeah, the that's, answer. The practical, yeah. how do you apply it is a new challenge. Thousands of people need to show, uh, join Chef AJ. Yes. In other words, the, the truth is, is that this thing is just as thorny and nasty as you can imagine. And, uh, and we have to understand that it is, uh, as, as we pointed out in the book, this is exactly your motivational system has now been totally hijacked and it's going the wrong direction. You know, if you've ever had that feeling on a freeway or on a highway somewhere and you can't quite figure out where you are and you go for a while and you finally find, oh, you know, I, you, you know, we're in Salisbury. We're supposed to be go. We totally went the wrong direction. Boy, don't I know that. <laughs> yeah, your nervous system is, is, is now operating an environment where it feels right to go the wrong direction. That is a, that is an extraordinarily difficult problem to solve. It is solvable, but it's, it, it, that is the problem. Yeah. Well, you know, Bill, who's watching live, says escaping the pleasure trap actually gives you freedom. And I've always told people do the least restrictive diet they can do, but that will give them the results they seek. So it seems to depend on what results people want and how susceptible they are to these pleasure trap foods, whether or not they need complete abstinence or perfection, like me and Alan, or can have carrot cake, like Dr. Lyle. Of course. Yeah. And speaking of carrot cake, Dr. L Dr. Goldhammer, you're convinced that you're going to outlive Dr. Lyle, even though you're a little bit older no, than No, I didn't say I'd outlive him. A lot of how long you live is largely genetic and luck. Uh, I'm much more likely to get shot or killed by somebody than Dr. Lyle is. But how well you live in the time you have might be determined in part by your diet and lifestyle choices. So what I'm hoping is that his occasional indulgence will cause just enough premature aging so that eventually 80, 85, 90, at some point, it might give me enough of an edge that I can finally beat him. Okay. Well, at some point, one of you, unless you're in a car accident together that's fatal, one of you is probably going to outlive the other. And I would imagine that the survivor would attend the funeral services of the leftover person and not leftover, but the person. So if you were to give the eulogy, what would you want the world to know about your extraordinary friend? Well, first of all, that's a big question, whether I would attend a funeral. I mean, he's dead by then. I don't know it does him any good at that point. So the funerals are for the living. So it would depend on if there's anybody else left alive that you know would be benefited by my uh, presence. But I would evaluate that very critically, first of all. And second of all, um, I think that the uh, you don't need to make much of a eulogy because I think that by the time he finally gets done with his second book, plus The Pleasure Trap, I think that the accomplishments will speak for themselves. Right. What would you say about, uh, if you outlived Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Lyle, what would you say about him? That's, a, that's a, his, his response was, was actually classic Alan. So you see, you see this, uh, there's just no sentimentality, you know, in, in this nervous system. <laughs> Is he part?
heart reptilian? Yeah, he's half reptile. <laughs> and does he have a heart? How is he able yeah. to get married? I just he's, don't get it. He's got a heart. And when his wife had an injury, I have this on, uh, on good report. His wife is injured. And Alan, like, as soon as he heard, he's like, bolting like hangs up the phone and he's running out of his office to his car like he just dropped all business so this guy might might try to sell you that he doesn't have a heart but he does it's in there it's in there just it's a hard you got to get just the right angle aj it's like a diamond you got to get just the right angle to see through it and that's what that's what's there but uh from my standpoint um i don't know uh I guess I I I, I was uh, I remember reading a few a uh, couple of years ago about Steve Jobs, uh, and apparently at the at the his last breath, uh, he said, "Wow." You know, I think it was a it was sort of a just a contemplation that he did all this and he lived this all and this was the end. But what what an experience he had. And, um, and that, that's what, that's what my eulogy, uh, would be about Alan. It would be the, the story of this sort of relentless, unshakable character who, who was going to do it, um, who was going to ask the questions and, and push everybody for the truth. And then he was just going to proceed in this life on the basis of that. And he, um, <laughs> He had to occupy the world with the rest of us, and the rest of us, because of our uh, because of our ignorance and sometimes our lack of uh, intelligence and sometimes of our lack of, of ability to uh, act with integrity, and because of our um, because of our emotional instability, uh, some of us are dangerous. Governments are dangerous, wanting to shut him down. Okay. He's, he's, he's spent a lot of his professional life um, literally being handicapped in what he would have done for the world because he had to play careful uh, because of uh, people that are uh, uh, vicious and, and uh, dangerous and uh, totalitarian in their thinking and are against the truth for their own relentless, profiteering, egotistical shit. And so... What I watched was I watched essentially, um, you know, Atlas uh, that that has been that has been shackled. He's had he's had one hand and one leg tied, and he he's done what he can, which is a hell of a lot, uh, given those those constraints. And I I'm watching now uh, at our age now, where fortunately we're both still very healthy and vibrant. Uh, we don't, we don't feel really much signs of any aging at all. We're, uh, uh, and I watch him now, uh, going into a period that I believe we're going to watch for the next, you know, 20 or 30 years of maybe his most productive time. He's, he's slowly been putting things in place. He's slowly guarded him against the jackals. And, uh, and now he's, uh, it's kind of like a Persian chessboard of accomplishment. And it takes a long time on the Persian chessboard, uh, the famous chessboard that I use as an analogy in the pleasure trap that, you know, if you start with a grain of sand on the first, the first square, and then you go to two grains of sand on the second, and then four on the third, and then eight on the fourth, the remember that on the last, uh, uh, the second to last thing on the chessboard, you only have half of what you're going to get at the end. And at eight, at, at the final thing of the chessboard, uh, on the first square of the final thing, you have almost no grains of sand. But you're going to massively increase that in just the last, on the last line of the board. And that's, that's what I'm watching. And so um, I'll be fascinated to observe uh, what happens in the next 30 years. Uh, people, this may sound sort of dramatic and, and, uh, fanciful, but it's not. The same is true of Colin Campbell. Uh, Colin Campbell, very carefully, he had to be very careful. When he tripped across the truths, uh, one of the most extraordinary stories in the history of science is 
is the fact uh, that Colin tells in his new book, The Future of Nutrition, is, the, is, is a bizarre truth, which is that, that animal protein was the hallowed chemical of nutritional biochemistry. And yet Colin discovers and understands, you know, 25 years ago, that it is in fact the very worst chemical in nutritional biochemistry. But literally it is by far the most dangerous thing that there is. So here he sits as a career nutritional biochemist at the very top level of the world intelligentsia. And he literally understands that the most dangerous thing is the most hallowed thing. And we find that they can't listen. They can't, and they will defend themselves. Too, too many circles of influence have been set in place and people don't have the courage. They, they don't have the guts and they don't have the wherewithal to face it. And Colin himself had to be exceedingly careful because he had people depending upon him. He had to be very careful about how he wrote grant proposals. He had to be very careful about how he wrote his articles. But he was putting in place an edifice of scientific chain of evidence that if you were reading and understanding what you were reading and you were careful and you realized, my God, what this guy is saying, he's attacking the most hallowed belief that we have. Okay. Well, so is Alan. So uh, Alan figures out that the most effective that you think that you can do is get rid of all of the crap. It's not just feeding healthy food. It's water fasting followed by a very healthy diet. Where is the medicine and surgery in this? And don't think that, that this isn't threatening. And it's also so bizarre. Like, no, the most important thing you got to do is you got to eat for God's sakes. Like, no, actually, that's not true hey, at Doug, all. You know, we just got a, a, uh, an article we had submitted for publication in one of the endocrinology journals that we did a study where we showed healthy people as a control and what happened to their body composition with fasting and showed that visceral fat was preferentially mobilized and lean tissue was preserved. And that the reviewer rejected the article saying that this was the most outrageous, dangerous uh, uh, paper that he's ever seen, that they would allow a person to not eat for two weeks time, that they were hoping that that person didn't suffer permanent damage, that this should be sent to a, uh, another review committee. They can't imagine how anybody, uh, but they said the paper was very well written. <laughs> what can I say? The bias was so thick, they, they couldn't even get through to look at the, didn't bother to look at the safety study that was cited or any of the supportive data. It was just such an outrageous knee jerk reaction. And, and that's in 25 years of reviewing articles. This is a guy, they're writing articles how to do de enervate the kidneys in order to treat high blood pressure and dr drugs that have devastating, kind of, but the worst, most outrageous, egregious example he'd ever seen in his career was this idea of allowing somebody to not eat for uh, two weeks in order to be able to you know, impact their health. That, that the, at least we're number one. There you go. Wow. There you that's go. That, that's an example. In, in my eulogy, this is, this is very similar to Colin. So Colin, uh, my Persian chessboard, you know, Alan at 60-ish, we won't nitpick about the details. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think that Colin wrote the China study at 72. Think about that. So he finally sort of comes out of the closet and is secure enough and he's retired professor emeritus. Now he's writing the China study at 72, okay? And look what has happened since. So after that, he writes whole. And now he writes the future of nutrition. In other words, the most extraordinary period, I mean, certainly a tremendous period of discovery in science, but always under the shadow of the jackals, okay? having to be very careful, have to watch your step, have to look over your shoulder, okay? And now at 72, Colin, I remember him saying uh, when he was talking about after the success of the China study, which surprised him as much as anybody, surprised me, I thought, great book. Nobody's gonna read all that stuff right. at all. It's too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but he did. And it was extremely successful, which is like truly feeding, you know, th th this is absolutely like feeding sugar to bacteria or something. I'm trying to come up with an analogy, but you, you basically emboldened Colin Campbell. When you, when you see that the world wanted to hear what he had to say, it's like, okay, I remember him telling us, uh, I think it might've been both of us, but it might've been just me. He says, well, in this next book, I'm really gonna, I'm really gonna <laughs> talk to I'm gonna name names, okay? And we get whole, which I, when I read that, I thought that, that's it, you've said it all. Okay, you, that, that is the, <laughs> the deepest, most beautifully written encapsulation of his theory that uh, a revolutionary concept. And then he turns around and writes The Future of Nutrition a few years later, which is again, a phenomenal book. Right. And, um, and so that, that's, where, that's where I think I'm gonna be sitting if I manage to uh, uh, live a little bit longer than Alan, which is unlikely, he's so damn robust. He's always a better physical specimen. <laughs> Look at those teeth, Jesus. <laughs> the, um, but if, if that happens, I'm going to have that wow feeling. And I think that, that a bunch of that wow is going to be things that we're going to see in the future. Okay. Well, if I outlive either of you, I will be happy to give the eulogy. And uh, Dr. Goldhammer, at yours, I would play my way as the song for sure. That is, that is Alan's song, even Absolutely. though it won't. It won't sing to Alan's soul the way it sings to my soul, because Alan's like, yeah, whatever. But that that is Alan's song. Yep. Absolutely, as much as Sinatra. So I saved the controversial question for last. If you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. But everybody wants to know from every guest how you feel about the COVID vaccine and sure. if you're going to get it. So let's be clear that nobody, including us, knows exactly what's going on with COVID vaccine because it's, it's really new, fresh, experimental. The data is not clear. And there's some question about how the data is being presented. For example, in the United States, if a person dies that has COVID, regardless of whether the COVID is the primary cause of death or uh, you know some other issue is the cause of death, they are called and labeled as COVID death. Uh, from my understanding. So that means you got to understand that, for example, if a person is maybe very old and very ill and happens to get COVID and dies, whether the COVID is the actual cause of fatality or their underlying uh, disease is the actual cause of fatality, they will be labeled COVID. That's not the same thing as other causes of death right now. So there can be a little bit of uh, confusion. The other thing from my understanding is the current vaccines, and there's a few of them out there, don't actually keep a person from contracting COVID, but may reduce the likelihood that that person goes to the hospital or dies as a consequence of it by activating the immune system to react to those little spike proteins or other characteristics of the coronavirus. It may uh, accentuate a person's ability to defend themselves more quickly. Whether that turns out to be true or not, I'm sure the data will be able to tell us you know, when we look back retrospectively. Um, but right now people think if they get the vaccine, now they're perfectly safe. Well, that's not actually the case. They may have reduced risk of mortality, but that doesn't mean they can't get or spread the infection. So their, their uh, confidence may be somewhat mislaid. And there are some concerns about side effects. For example, there are various chemicals along with the vaccine. For example, propylene glycol, which is essentially antifreeze, which may, is used to kind of keep things from, I guess, clumping together or something. Um, I was surprised to hear that some people have allergic reactions to that. I've used that chemical safely for years uh, in my car. But uh, in any case, so there may be risks, there may be benefits. We don't know exactly what all those are right now. So let's not uh, assume that everything that's going to be known is known because it is still an active and dynamic subject. But what isn't being done, in my opinion, that's most critical is to remember that one of the biggest risk factors from dying from cancer, from heart disease, from autoimmune diseases and from infectious disease, including COVID-19 is metabolic syndrome. People that are overweight that have diabetes and high blood pressure and have these risk factors are at significant higher risk of dying from everything. So perhaps what we should be doing is encouraging people to say, look, whether it's infectious disease or chronic disease, the most important thing you can do is adopt a health promoting uh, plant-based SOS free diet so that you reduce your risk factor from an unfortunate consequence of getting ill, avoid the illness, avoid the death from illness, adopt a whole plant food diet. 
Yeah, that's all. I, I couldn't disagree with that. Let me, I'll put in my two cents because uh, uh, this, this is like, this can sound like uh, we're dodging a question and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, uh, to, to have people think that, that we have any interest in dodging this question. Here's how I look at it. The, uh, as Alan said, there, there are unknowns. And so each individual, so I would say on the question of whether or not you should or shouldn't get a vaccine, uh, take a vaccine, this is a personal individual question and there, there is no such thing as a right answer to it. The, um, that, that, that's because your own analysis of your own risk situation is, is the subjective one just by nature. So the real question to me, um, with the whole world screaming in your ear that you should get the vaccine, the question is, is there any reasonable debate about this? And more specifically, is there a reasonable debate for you? And the answer is, yes, there is a reasonable debate for you. And uh, like, so I've now heard, for example, that they're planning to vaccinate children. That is insane. The, uh, nobody under 40 should be even dreaming about getting the vaccine unless you're a woman who's thinking about getting pregnant. The, uh, the, there, there's just the, the risk, there's just no reason for this. So, the, uh, so anyway, at, if we start talking about people over 40 that have some measurable risk factors, then you have to look at yourself and you have to look at your own situation. So I look at my own situation and uh, I'm old enough now to start creeping into a territory where, where correlation coefficients start indicating that I'm at higher risk level than I would have been 10 or 20 years ago. And so it's not nothing. Uh, but I look at myself and I, I look at, uh, I think the, the most important, uh, as Alan says, metabolic syndrome, but, you know, i.e. obesity is going to be, uh, Alan sent me an article showing me that this was a very large independent predictor. And last I checked, you know, I'm the closest thing to non-obese that you can get. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what do I think about my personal risk factors? Uh, I'm a male, so that makes me somewhat higher. Uh, but I'm uh, very health, you know, very health promoting lifestyle, very slender, and therefore I believe that my risk is exceedingly small. Okay, now, so now I, I can actually guesstimate what that risk is. Now let's call it one in five thousand, which is about the same risk I have this year of dying in an auto accident. So it's not nothing. Okay. However, I also have to then look at what do I think the risk of the vaccine is. And when I look at the risk of the vaccine, I will tell you that my estimate of the risk of the vaccine is unknown. I don't know what the risk of the vaccine is. And because I can't act, just because it's safe now and we don't see people dying in mass or winding up with mad cow disease in their head or anything else in the first 90 days, that tells me absolutely nothing about the long-term effects. And since I'm not 87 uh, years old and, and terrified of this possible uh, virus, then I'm looking to live a hell of a long time. So therefore I've got to be concerned about the long-term consequences of an experimental operation like this. So me personally, right now, not having better evidence about what the, what the secondary side effects might be, right now I'm sitting on the sideline. Now. Does that mean that that's a permanent decision? No, it's not a permanent decision. It's my personal estimate of my personal risk factors at this time in my life against my estimation of how long I'm gonna live and my understanding that science in this arena has an interesting habit of overlooking risk factors in their, in their concoctions. Does that mean I'm very suspicious in an anti-vaxxer? No, it doesn't. I am not a suspicious anti-vaxxer. I'm just suspicious of medicine in general. <laughs> okay, and so, uh, and again, because I am who I am, I'm not that intimidated by COVID. I've known a lot of my friends have had it. They've had a bad two or three days and that's what they had. So I have every reason to suspect that if I got COVID, that's what I would have. Okay, I'd have a shitty few days and then I would be done with it. 
So uh, could I be wrong? Yes. Could I get COVID and die from it? Yes, it would be front page news in some little tiny vegan thing. You know, not that the world would care, but it'd be like, whoa, how irresponsible was that? And my answer is, I'm not being irresponsible. I'm making my own personal decision at and this time. The, the other mistaken assumption is people think that well, even if it doesn't help you, it's going to help society. But the yeah. reality is that because you've been vaccinated, it doesn't mean you can't get or spread COVID. So you still have to take all the same precautions that you would, whether you're vaccinated or you're not vaccinated. Um, if you look at influenza, which we have better data on, if you're not vaccinated in any given year, you have a 2% chance of, of contracting influenza two out of 100. If you're fully vaccinated, you have a 1% chance. Now they say, well, it's a 50% reduction, which, you know, it is a 50% reduction. And that might be big enough to have a herd effect. But yeah. for you individually, your chances are two in 100 versus one in 100. And the price you pay with a uh, flu vaccine is there's some concerns about the thymosol, which is mercury. You know, getting a year's worth of mercury in a, in a dose, maybe that's not such a great idea or other immunological consequences. Nobody knows because it's very difficult to get. You can't even talk about this without risk of getting a check on YouTube because anybody that says anything, raises any question is considered you know, anti-science or pro-Trump or whatever. You know, it's been politicized to the point that it's beyond any reasonable, uh, any reasonable level of common discussion. Uh, but the reality is influenza vaccine has known risks and benefits and a COVID vaccine has unknown uh, risks and benefits at this point. So it would be nice to look back on it. And if, like, if I knew now what I know then, I could buy Apple stock at $2 a share and I'd be a multi-billionaire and could fund all the research that we're trying to do. But right. we don't know because we, didn't, we don't have that kind of hindsight yet. Yeah, so again, if anybody comes to me and says, well, they got the vaccine and they're excited about it, I'm like, good for you. I, I have no, no problem. That's your, your uh, personal decision. Uh, if someone says, no, I'm not gonna do it, that also seems reasonable to me. So I'm it not- is, It's likely thing. though that people that are on healthy diets and lifestyle would be less likely to have untoward negative effects from vaccines, it, just common sense, than would be the people at highest risk. So the people that are worried the most may be actually the people that are at the least risk either way. Probably so, true. Wow, you guys are, this has just been so much fun talking to you guys. If you haven't gotten the pleasure trap, please get it. As Dr. Goldhammer says, it's not what you want to hear, but it's what you need to know. I do have to say, Queen of Aries, Gina and Anissa for the super chat donation. So thank you guys for getting me those donations. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. I'm sure that Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Lyle will come back again, either together or separately to get some of the questions we didn't get to. But please come back tomorrow when I will be celebrating my birthday along with Heather McDougall. It's her birthday with the entire McDougall family. Thanks so much, Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer. Thank you, AJ. And thanks for having us. Bye, Dr. Goldhammer. Bye. <laughs>